Hey bros, you know I used to live in this exact unit in 450 Sims Avenue. I paid $1,600, that was 3-4 years ago. Yeah, it's a studio room, this is the toilet, and you know, behind here is the door to this kitchen, where we have an induction cooker, it's connected to a power socket. Yeah, so this is an old building that was kind of chopped up by the landlord, partitioned by the landlord to make it into like, you know, mini studios throughout the four-story building. So this is on the third floor, this is new, this is new, this is new. This was here all along. Point is, I want to say that rent is crazy expensive in Singapore these past two, three years. You know, I live in the outskirts of Singapore, like the corner corner most part of Singapore that's almost like Malaysia sort of. And look at all these rows of houses after houses after houses. And did you know, every single square block in the sky cost almost or around 500,000 Singapore dollars. So in this video, I'm going to share with you how I managed to house hack in one of the world's most expensive city. I paid $30,365 and managed to save $19,200 which I would normally pay in rent or I used to pay in rent. I'm going to show you what I did, how I did it, the numbers, what were some of the struggles, some, what are some of the considerations to house hacking in Singapore right now. For those of you who are new to my channel, I'm an ex-professional athlete turned YouTuber slash real estate agent in Singapore and I help people build confidence with money so that they can pursue their dreams and passion. So before we begin, let's talk about how it all started. When I was 16, I left the Singapore national team. At that point in time, you know, it was, I was very, hmm, how do I put it? I wanted a lot, right? I wanted to be successful, rich and successful. I was obsessed about investing and growing my wealth. So I read all the investing books like uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Think and Grow Rich, Your Intelligent Investor, follow all the Warren Buffett stuff. I was a Buffettologist, you know, sort of. You know the saying, if you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. So it was during that period of time that I realized that it wasn't about how much money you make, but rather how much money you can actually save after, you know, how much money you make. So the more you can save, that's how, that's your gunpowder to using that money to work for you. And because I started working since I was 15 and I was saving a lot, I was living like I was broke, I was able to achieve, according to Tony Robbins, the, the lowest level of financial freedom. And I actually documented that in one of my videos. I'm gonna leave it over here, um, but there's still a lot more that I can achieve. I remember that at one point when I was doing up my financials, right, how much money I make, how much money I spent, rental was 40% of my income. It was crazy. So once I started to learn how I can creatively reduce that figure, life became a lot more affordable in Singapore. And in 2020, I finally, finally managed to make housing, you know, having a roof over my head, zero dollars every single month. You know, I remember the good old days when I was first exploring how the house hack in Singapore. I think I was 20 years old at the time. Or was it 19? I think 20 years old. So I was looking for a condo in Ang Mokyo. The name is called Grandeur 8. Back then, the three bedder, right? The three bedder was asking for $3,000, which you cannot find anymore. The master bedroom at that point in time could fetch like $1,300, then the common room maybe uh, $1,000. So if I rent out the master and the common, and I live in a common room, I would only pay $700 for a condo with swimming pool, with gym, and very close access to town because it's very central. Where else? At that point in time, I remember I was already renting a HDB, government subsidized flat with no facilities, that's $800 a month. So in Singapore, no landlord really likes the idea of tenants subletting to other tenants because you you know, it's a lot of people and having more people means more mess and damages to your house. So I remember when I was researching, I actually went to the property, took photos and put that property on carousel to try to do some sort of my own market research on how many people would be interested to rent the place. And it was mind boggling how many people were interested to rent the property for $1,000 for one of those rooms. And I remember when I pitched to the uncle my deal, I was asking him, hey uncle, uh, I really want to rent this place because it's near to my school uh, and stuff like that. And you know, I was trying to subtly imply that I was going to sublet without being too obvious. I said, you know uncle, I have a few more friends that's coming over, but they haven't come over yet. Can I, you know, add them in after a while? And I think the uncle got my message. <laughs> he was like, sure, sure, you can do it. But uh, you know, you can only, each room can rent to one or maximum two person and you must let me know who they are. So that was my own experience trying to rental hack within Singapore. Introducing house hacking, rent hacking in Singapore. Basically the idea of what house hacking is about is that let's say you have, you know, three rooms, one, two, three, right? You stay in one of these rooms, you have two rooms left, you rent out this room to other people and you use other people's money to subsidize 
your house, your flat. Basically, the goal is that you want to be able to live rent-free or even profit every single month by renting out these two rooms. That's the basic idea of house hacking or rent hacking in general. So you need to keep in mind that I'm not a perfect example of rent hacking, house hacking in Singapore because I did make some personal sacrifices which in turn reduces the amount of money I can make. Additionally, there are also a lot of restrictions that you need to take note of. For example, if you are a foreigner in Singapore, you cannot buy a HDB flat in Singapore. You're not allowed to. Buying condos would be significantly more expensive. So the numbers are very different. So if you're a foreigner, you kind of need to wait till you're a permanent resident and then you can potentially try out my method. And because you're also living in a flat, there's always compromises between paying a premium for a place that feels a lot like home. It's very comfortable, very convenient versus trying to find as cheap a property as possible to house hack so that you can ideally pay zero dollars but it does not feel as homely as possible so this means that you need to have good communication with your partner otherwise there could be a lot of friction in your relationship so for example in my case i actually um, rent out one of my rooms to a tenant and the other to my cousin so my cousin is not paying anywhere near a market rate or the property price and the reason we decide to do this is number one my cousin-in-law is actually a foreigner, so having him close to us, family that's close to us, is very nice. Number two, we have two cats in the house, which we call our kids, and we travel very often, like, I don't know, four or five times a, a year. And when we travel, nobody is here to look after our kids, so then we would have to send our kids to, like, pet hostels, pet hotels, and that is always a very stre stressful experience for our cats. And it is much better to have a family taking care of them rather than having them, you know, stressed out and all that stuff. And because of these reasons, we are willing to accept a lower rent in return for more comfort. I just want to show you this chubby belly. Oof, oof, oof. Aww. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people have talked much about house hacking in Singapore. And I think one key reason is that people get very upset when they hear of this idea that, hey, you're profiting off HDB. It's government subsidized, it's for the people, but you're profiting off taxpayers' dollars. And because you're profiting off, you end up driving this price, the prices of these homes even higher, making it more unaffordable to a lot of people. While I think that has merits, I also think that it is very important to, you know, get educated because this is the structure we have in our society. This knowledge, whether you use it or not, it's going to be very helpful because you never know when you or your friends or your loved ones might need it. So do you agree with what I said? And as with all calculations that I talked about in this video, um, please do your own uh, calculation again because I could make mistakes. And number two, these numbers could be old by the time you actually research or watch this video so therefore the numbers might be totally off. Singapore is a very land scarce space and most people live in high-rise buildings which are phenomenally expensive. So just to give you an idea, a thousand square feet rental um, that is in a government subsidized flat in the outskirts, the far far outskirts in Singapore would cost around $4,500 in Singapore. Buying a house in Singapore is crazy expensive assuming you are eligible to buy a subsidized house the, the, for the price of the government subsidized flats, you are able to easily afford two homes in our neighboring countries, you know, up, left, down. Or you can even buy like one lender property, which in Singapore will cost, you know, 3 million Singapore dollars and above. If you buy two properties, obviously it's a lot simpler. Your family lives in one, you rent out the other, you profit off that to try and subsidize the other. It's a no-brainer. But in Singapore, because of the price of the house as well as the additional taxes that you need to pay to buy to own multiple properties, it is crazy expensive to be able to afford two homes here. So if you're new to Singapore or you're a Singaporean that's never considered house hacking, I just want to tell you that it is 100% possible i'm gonna show you the math in fact a long time ago i remember asking this question on reddit to kind of understand how prevalent and how many people kind of talk about it know about it and discuss about it on reddit people do carry it actually they do know of people who also house hack but i need to mention that what makes it particularly tough in singapore to house hack is because there are a lot of regulations uh, commonly known as cooling measures in Singapore and they impose a lot of restrictions for example on housing loans so you can't completely borrow money to pay 100% zero cash down in Singapore you must always have some sort of cash payment number two there's also a lot of additional taxes if you try to own multiple properties and number three there is if you buy a government subsidized flat there's like minimum occupancy period of five years there's also a restriction on who you can rent out who you can't rent out when you rent out to someone there's also a minimum lease period 
and much much more rules basically if you want to stay do like short term Airbnb in Singapore to try and profit a lot more it is not possible for HDB flat so do not try because you might actually end up losing your house okay so now let's talk about the numbers of buying a property and trying to house hack in Singapore so for me my place costs five hundred and nineteen thousand dollars which is the cheapest in the block it's hard to find a four room flat in Singapore at that price now but I'm going to show you very briefly all the details on what are some of the fees that were involved to pay for the property but in summary the total cash that I paid was thirty thousand three hundred and sixty five the total amount of CPF that was deducted from me was twenty four thousand and two dollars and twenty two cents so the total down payment is 54k plus and my monthly installment back then was 1393 but now because of the high interest rate environment it has risen to about $2,021.03 but I think it'll probably rise a lot more given the news that we've been hearing. Other costs that were involved were my renovation and furnishing costs which adds up to about $55,370. So I'm not going to talk about all this. If you do want to find out more about um, how I try to save costs and the numbers in detail for, my, for the purchase of my house, do leave a comment below. I'm happy to share them in another video. But for now, we're talking about house hacking. To be honest, my house was a move-in condition so I didn't really need to renovate but because my partner wanted a very homely feel and we've worked super hard for it, I felt that we deserve a little a luxury for ourselves so we decided to renovate first before we moved in and that cost us a lot of money and financially it is very expensive. So it's a financial sacrifice that we knew and decided to take on knowing the opportunity cost. So let's talk about the house hacking numbers. After I've paid the initial amount of money, how long did it take for me to rent out my room? I actually posted it on Carousel and because our flat was two minutes to the bus interchange, it was snapped up within three weeks. So I was able to rent it out really easily, downloaded templates on the rental agreement, got started. So expenses include mortgage, utilities, miscellaneous like your aircon repair, cleaning services once in every while, conservancy, charges, fire insurance, property tax, stamp duties, as well as the home insurance scheme that you have to pay every single year. So in terms of total income, I get 1,600 every single month and that breaks down to 1,200 from the tenant, and 400 from my cousin and not only that because you know every month when I pay the mortgage a portion of that is actually equity which we retain and that amount adds up to $1,111.37 so once you minus all these numbers right in actuality when I did my calculation back then the number that I got was that every month I would earn $1,317 and now given the rise in interest rates I still net off with a positive $238.31 and then my friends is how I managed to live rent free in Singapore. So if you're not in a position where you can just buy a place and reduce your cost of living in Singapore, there is another way called rent hacking in Singapore. I'm not too familiar with these numbers because I haven't done this or researched this in a very long time but let's use Grandeur 8, the property in which I first started researching on as my you know test potential house hacking place. So when I check the Grandeur 8 prices on Property Guru right now, the 3 bed 3 baths together with one study is asking for about $5,000 a month. So it's almost like three master bedrooms sort of. And master bedrooms, when I check out the prices, it's about $2,000 every single month. Because this place is relatively central. So if, let's say, you have three rooms, you rent out two, you, you stay in one, you effectively have to pay $1,000 for one master bedroom plus one study for your own use along with all the condo facilities that's in a relatively central location. Bear in mind, there's a lot more work that needs to be done into this so I haven't dig deep into the numbers whether these toilets are in the bedrooms or is it separated so because that affects rental prices. And not to mention, when I started rent hacking or researching into rent hacking, it was actually extremely hard to find landlords that were agreeable to let you sublet a property to reduce your rental costs. And not to mention, during the interim, there is a risk of you not being able to rent out the rooms for a while, as well as the deposits that you pay because you're renting the entire flat. It's a lot more expensive. So all these needs to be taken into consideration before you exploring and committing to rent hacking in Singapore. Then I know some of you might be wondering, Gerald, actually this is not free. Every month you're paying cash. You know, in Rich Dad Poor Dad, if you pay cash, you are losing money. It is not an asset, it's a liability. This like, answer. I know and I agree with you like I am paying cash every month because the interest rate rose very sharply back then it was cash positive now it's not but there is this thing called home equity so of the money that I pay every single month as mortgage a portion of that goes to building 
equity. Not to mention, I did not rent out both rooms at the highest possible price because of a personal sacrifice me and my family decided to take. So when you build up home equity, right, it's very different from renting a property outside because home equity, you can get that back when you sell your property. So think of it as like putting your money in a fixed deposit. At some point in time, when you sell your house, you actually get to cash out, take out that money. But conversely, if you, you know, rent from a landlord, you know, you're not going to get your money back from landlord. You can't just, I don't know, buy 10 months, get two months free. It doesn't work that way. So that's why home equity is also an asset to my name. Now let's talk about the opportunity cost, right? Why not buy a BTO in Singapore? So I did consider buying a BTO, but after we calculated, there's a lot of cost involved in waiting. Okay, so let's break down the, the math, right? If we successfully balloted, we'd get our flats approximately four years later. So that was in 2020. It is approximately 30% cheaper, but we could also end up with not getting any ballot and having nothing at all. So when I calculated the stats from my own perspective, when I saw each flat that was available, there was approximately 10 first-timer buyers that are eyeing for a four-room flat. It's basically a 10% chance, assuming everyone has equal chance, times four launches a year, meaning to say on average, you can expect to wait two and a half years if you want to go for a unit that's at a popular site, a mature site. So adding in the construction time, that takes 6.5 years. Not to mention, you need to fulfill your five-year minimum occupancy period, which means I need to have invest in my first flat and live in my flat for 11 years. So by then, I'll be quite a lot older and I'm kind of stuck in a place where I cannot buy additional properties because I'm stuck with this one property. Not to mention the very long waiting time, which I will calculate the numbers in a bit. Of course, if you use the Ministry of National Development's data, they also publish that if you try to bid for non-mature estates only, on average, you take two tries and you would almost guaranteed to get your flat. Even if you include that, that brings down the waiting time to roughly four and a half years. So when we calculated, you know, in terms of opportunity cost, because if I do not have a flat to stay, I need to pay rent, correct? So assume no inflation, just 1,600, which I used to pay times 12 months, times the amount of years, these are the opportunity costs I would incur if I try for mature estates versus non-mature estates. Similarly, I also need to at the fact that I cannot house hack as early as I could, right? So that, if you add in together, my opportunity cost would be well over 200,000 or 150,000 if you calculate non-mature estates. So given this huge opportunity cost, was it worth it? Not to mention five years of your life. Mm, I'm quite conflicted about this. So, and again, at this point, if you're kind of overwhelmed by the numbers that I flashed through the screens, you have no idea why, how it came up with certain numbers, you want to clarify, you have any questions, please um, leave them in the comment section down below or join my WhatsApp community where we can discuss this at length or hear what other people has to share about this topic because I may not be the best at this. And the second question some of you might ask is why not a smaller or a larger flat? Because a smaller flat would be cheaper, a larger flat might be more worth it, right? Five-room HDB seems to be the most popular in Singapore. So according to dollars and cents, the difference between a three and four bedroom HDB for my particular uh, district is $87,900 but I notice all the district on average is about $100,000 and since I can borrow 75% of it, I approximately need to pay $25,000 extra cash to get one extra bedroom. So if I buy a smaller place, three bedroom flat, this means I get a lesser bedroom to rent out and there's a huge opportunity cost which I will calculate in a bit. Whereas the difference between a four bedroom and five bedroom is not one extra bedroom in Singapore. I don't know why, but double the living room space, which if you're in HDB, you're not allowed to partition and rent out the extra room. So when you calculate the opportunity cost of one bedroom, in my case, I peg it at $1,200 minus 50% maintenance fees, as well as $4.80 for stamp duty. That means the opportunity cost is $1,015.60, which is approximately $12,000 per year. So that extra bedroom makes 13.8% more income before any sort of leverage. So it takes seven and a half years of rental of that room to get that extra room completely for free. And your property in Singapore is like, what, 99 years? So you actually have plenty of time to break even. It almost makes a lot more sense to get a larger room. But if you calculate leverage, that's when the numbers get ridiculous. Because I can borrow 75%, effectively to get the extra bedroom which costs 100 or 87k in bongo i only need to pay an extra twenty two thousand dollars in cash and 
paying extra 22k this room makes me 12k a year so that's like 55% return on the additional dollars that I spend. Talk about a no-brainer. Obviously, I'm going to get an extra room if I can afford it. So it's only with experience, with hindsight and, you know, talking to other people, I realized that actually there are a lot of people that subdivide their room. So if you get a five-room flat, you can kind of, you know, cut it up and rent out that room. But uh, in Singapore, it's not quite legal. Don't get caught, otherwise you'll be in trouble. Um, but if you rent like condos and such, you can actually get a larger place with no bedrooms and then add walls yourself and then use those rooms to profit. Yeah, just one thing to note uh, when you're actually investing in overseas properties or condos in Singapore. Important considerations when you're house hacking. You and your partner needs to be okay with it. Like for me, me and my partner, we've been renting outside together, co-living with other people for five years before we decide, hey, even our own home, we are comfortable, confident that we will be just fine co-living with other people. The worst thing that can happen is that you do this without informing and telling your partner, which is what my parents did. What ended up happening in our house hacking idea was that the tenants were constantly being chased away. As a result, we actually did not have enough money to pay for the house and the house was foreclosed by the government, by the banks not the government. So most of the time when I share with Singaporeans or friends, they are usually quite shocked like, oh, you live with tenants. A lot of people also have this mentality that, hey, the whole reason why you work so hard, you save up a lot is so that you can come home to a nice homely environment to relax. And if you have other people in your home, you do not feel very homely and comfortable. And that is a decision I also respect. Another real concern is kids in the house because a lot of people who are, you know, who have kids, they share with me like they're very, very fearful to have their kids, their little boys, sons and daughters living with other strangers while they're out there working and not able to care for their children. And I agree the safety of a child is beyond anything else. But on my own, I also do have some ideas on how you can solve this problem. One is that I would ask my grandparents or, you know, my parents to move in, which is my kids' grandparents, to live with me and rent out their home completely. That's one idea. Another way is that you actually can build partition walls to try to fence off. So you kind of have like a studio um, apartment within your flat, right? So that you can ensure that your children stays within the studio and not get unsafe with the other strangers in the flat. Either way, I think every Singaporean can agree that kids are a very expensive sacrifice. Hit a thumbs up if you agree with that statement. So while it seems like I got it all figured out, in reality, it wasn't a smooth sailing journey. I met a lot of troubles and difficulties and challenges because not a lot of people talk about it in Singapore. Not to mention, I actually had to pay a lot of cash. So in total, even though, you know, the down payment, I paid 30365 in reality, I actually paid $85,735 in cash and 24k in CPF. But we actually set up, I think it was 120k aside in cash because you cannot live, you know, too close to the edge. If not, we run out of money. And not to mention during that time, I think crypto was booming. So I actually have a lot of money from crypto.com. Got lucky at that point in time. Not to mention for this 120k, it's not just me. It's actually me and my wife. So it makes it a lot easier. But even that, right preceding that getting to that savings amount for both of us was not easy in fact for myself i started saving since i was i got my first job which was when i was 15 coaching you know badminton part-time during my army days i actually cycled 30 minutes to camp every single day i ate all my meals three meals in army when i didn't have to not to mention i've never once visited crunchy camp 3's canteen so i don't know that the muachi was nice until after i ord point is i saved all that money for years not to mention when it comes to spending i really really tried to live cheap all my clothes were gifts or almost sponsored by you know competitions that i played in the past and in uni i ate the same 370 thai fun shop in smu so till now i actually don't know the prices and the name of the stores nearby point is i could go on and on about how um, i tried really hard to save all this while and they kind of paid dividends over time right in fact um, at one point in time i amassed almost six figures 100k plus but i actually lost um, 40k due to uh, bad options trade because i was new to options at that point in time attended a course did learn well and actually lost 40k i know it's going to be a long time for you to save up but don't just you know aim for the bare minimum try to go above and beyond with your savings spend more time planning for the future it helps a lot if i can try to give myself a tip you know to when i first started is to try starting to track how much you're spending and how much you're saving every single month try to save a little more over time it becomes a habit it becomes much easier and over a decade of hard work and planning and reading up and learning and working and all that stuff i finally bought my very first home made it 
rent free for myself when I was 27 years old. So if I can do it, so can you. Anyways, in my next video, I plan to talk about how I found this property which I'm living at, which is an undervalued property for almost 150k less than my neighbors which are right above me so if you like you can check out that video over here or check out what youtube recommends you over here and last but not least let me know what you think in the comment section below and i'll see you next time take care and stay safe everyone sure.